Church. How's everybody doing today? All right, let me read from Psalm 97. Listen to this. The Lord reigns. Let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and ju justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt the wax before, like wax before the Lord. Before the Lord of all the earth, the heavens proclaim his righteousness, and all people see his glory. We are about to worship that God. Isn't that exciting? Let that stir in your heart. Come on, let's do it. Stand up. Bless our God. He's so good. He's so good. Don't stop. It sounds so good. Put a smile on God's face today.
a good side, God, we serve. What an amazing God we serve. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. Saul says that God can provide for you wherever you are. He can bring honey from a rock. He can bring water from a stone. Our God can do anything. And you know what? He has already moved heaven and hell for you. What's going to stop him now from doing everything else that we need and that because of his love, amen? Because of his love.
I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation. Let it all go And I see it now I'm laying it down And I know that I need you Run to the Father
and I exalt Thee. And I exalt Thee. And I exalt Thee. O Lord. And I exalt Thee. And I exalt Thee. Come on and worship in church. And I exalt Thee, O Lord, for Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth, above the earth, above the earth. name if you don't know what to say. Jesus, holy Jesus, how 
worship you. I exalt you, my God, my King, my Lord. You're my passion, oh God. You're my strength, oh Lord. You're my refuge, oh God. You're my Lord. You're the love of my life. times where you get to a place where that's just kind of where you want to stay for a while. You know what I'm talking about? The Lord's just meeting you there. And it's like, that's a really good, cool place to be. So what I'm going to do, I've kind of found my place here this morning. And I'm going to concede my time and ask Pastor John to sing that last song a little bit longer, just so I can enjoy it. You all can join in too, if you like. There's a place in worship. There's no pla- There's no better place to go. There's, there's, there's no dessert to that. That's the whole buffet. You are in the presence of the Almighty. So let's stay there a bit longer if we can. Today, can you lift your hands and surrender to Him in worship? I exalt Thee.
Praise God, praise God. You know, I, I've got to tell you, I, I, I liken that to my week. A lot of times my worship and my prayer time is kind of like a shower. You get in and, you, and, you, and you're praying and trusting God, but you're going about your day. And, and kind of the cool thing about what we just did there, this is like a nice hot bath with no, no alarm clock. You know what I mean? You just in the presence of God, just shut everything off and just enjoy his presence. And we live in a time where it's so difficult to get the head space in the room to do that because there's so many input, in, too many messages coming in that are contrary to what we know to be true. So that's why I wanted to have Pastor John and the team just, that's, that's old time Pentecostal stuff for me. It's like, you know, hey, if you feel the Lord moving, sing, just, that, that's, if the Lord is in that song, in that crime of praise, that's where you stay. There's no theology that I can share with you that will impress him, but if he is smiling upon us for praising his name, don't move. Go, just, just enjoy it, right? Praise God. Praise God. It's so absolutely wonderful, so praise God. Well, a couple of things I need to pray about. I've got my list. Uh, I've got a cheat sheet here. I feel like I should be in politics. Um, some of you will get that. But <laughs> anyway... Um, from Pastor Barry, good morning, waking up in Alabama, eating bacon and drinking gravy. He didn't say that, but I think he meant to say it, but anyway. Okay, we need to lift up Hayden Page and Victoria. Victoria was diagnosed with COVID yesterday. Quarantine at Belinda's, but ramp school starts in a few days. And tell everyone how wonderful you are and how great we are. Thankful you have you here as a pastor. No, I don't want that's all, I, it was my insert there, sorry. What we're going to do now is community time. So what we, I'm going to open up with, I'm going to close or open with the word of prayer. Then we'll, we'll greet one another. Then we'll get to this. Father, we give you thanks and praise for the opportunity to be gathered in your house. We thank you, Father, for the privilege and the honor of calling you Father, that Jesus Christ is our risen Lord and Savior. There is no way to you but through him. And we proclaim Jesus Christ for all to hear. So, Father, God, bless this time of fellowship today. Bless this time of teaching, the time of worship and the time of praise and the, just the time where we can commune one together. And Lord God, I just give you the thanks and praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So get up and say hi to somebody and we'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. glad you're here with us today. If we have any first-time visitors, please raise your hand so we can all stare at you for just a few moments. There you go. Get a good look over there. Look nice today. You got your church clothes on. Good to see that. Praise the Lord. The anointing's all over you, folks. I can feel it now in the name of Jesus. But I digress. If you are a first-time visitor, we have some connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. Just fill one of those out, and you can drop it in the little box on the way out. And um, we will put you on our, we have an email spam list. We try to send something out two or three times a day. <laughs> Kidding. That's a joke. No, we will not bother you. Pastor Nick will reach out to touch base, which is a great thing, by the way. And um, 
We're glad you're here today. Pastor Nick is not here today. He's watching, I'm sure, and making a note card as to why he won't be letting me do this anymore. <laughs> but we have Pastor John going to be teaching here in just a bit. We'll introduce him later because he certainly needs an introduction. But we do have some videos. Let's start with those. Hello, sisters and brothers. Eleni here, back with your weekly announcements. We are so happy you could join us here at New Hope Church in Palm Harbor. Here's what we've got going on in our church. Midweek Bible study will continue with Pastor Tom and Lori in the sanctuary on Wednesdays at 7, while the youth group continues to meet in the Forge building. Pastor Nick will be holding another membership workshop on Saturday, September 3rd from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., where he will be telling us the heart and the mission of the church. If you would like to attend, please fill out a connect card with the word membership. And childcare is available for those in need with pre-registration only. On Sunday, September 4th, after service, we will be having our annual Labor Day picnic. So make sure that you're dressed and ready to have some fun. We will be providing hot dogs and hamburgers. So if anyone would like to bring sides, and then also we will have a water slide for the kids and our annual cornhole tournament. As always, thank you for your continuous offerings. You can always give online, via mail, using the donation boxes at the sanctuary doors, or using the QR code with your smartphone. Thank you so much for joining me and have a blessed day. God. Praise God. Well, today our special speaker is Pastor John Courtney. Pastor John is, is, we have very much, we have a lot in common, John and I. We both used to have more hair. We both used to weigh less. We've both been in ministry a long time. We're both happily married. That's right. And we both have children that keep us on our knees far more than we're comfortable with. Here's what I say about John Courtney. I don't say this about a lot of people because I don't know them well enough to say that. But, of course, he's a Christian. We all know that. But I've served with him long enough in ministry to also tell you this, and this is no light thing for me. He's a good man. And I'm, I'm cool with that. I want to put a plug in, can you hear me, to uh, Pastor Tom's Wednesday. I watch it almost every week. Uh, best hour and a half nap I get. <laughs> Un we have an understanding, him and I. That means the opposite. And I'm going to encourage you, if you can't make it here, it's better if you're here, but if you can't, put it online because it is awesome. And uh, that, now that Lori's come on, it's like off the charts. It, it got spiritual, actually, so, which is a good thing. I thought I had my notes set up here. This is a... <laughs> and you know what? My glasses are over there, dear. <laughs> you know, I, uh, some of you know I got into a, an accident in December. And, uh, you know, I do pretty good, but instead of having the body of a 50-year-old, sometimes it's the body of a 90-year-old. Uh, the good thing is, is that I have a young wife, so she ties my shoes for me, which is really good. <laughs> and sometimes she wipes the spittle. No, no. That's pretty, that's a bad, that's a horrible picture. My notes are gone, so I'm not preaching. Actually, that's why I have the hard copy. So as, uh, as I was uh, 
preparing, Pastor Nick had said, hey, look, I'm going away. I want you to preach. And um, I was praying and praying, God, what do you want me to do? And Pastor Nick had, you know, said during one of the meetings, he goes, you know, you got, you know, he never says, I suggest this and you have to do it. He's not that kind of leader. But he said, look, good idea. Maybe you guys can all take a parable or some parables and you could preach on that and it will kind of flow with the whole kingdom of God thing we've been talking about. And I was like, dude, really? But you know what? God has been speaking to me through this parable I'm going to share with you today. And uh, many of you have heard it. Many of you have heard preaching on it. But I will tell you this. Um, this isn't going to be anything like that <laughs> at all. And as I was preparing, I said, Lord, what do you want me to say? So let me go ahead and read it. And uh, if you can follow along, you probably follow along on the screen. And go ahead and flip that, my friend. It says, uh, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. What a good son. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his, him and his sons. Now I want you to remember that. He divided his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son, who had a plan, obviously, <laughs> packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time this, his money ran out, now you understand this, this wasn't a few days. This, this could have been several months. It could have been actually years. It could have been quite a long time. A great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And if you know anything about the Jewish uh, culture and about Old Testament, uh, Jews didn't have anything to do with pigs. Um, they were unclean animals. You couldn't even touch a pig. You had nothing to do with this animal because it was considered unclean. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both you and heaven, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get him a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now he has returned to life. He was lost, and now he is found. So the party began. Now I'm going to continue with the second son, because this story is not about one person. It's about three. It's about the two sons. And it's about the father. Now I may not be able to get to the father today, because honestly, I could take six weeks on this parable alone, because there's so much. It's so rich. But God's not allowing me that, so <laughs> we're going to do the best with what we have. So we're going to go ahead and skip down there. You've got to be creative with me, okay, Noah? This, the parable, if you've ever looked in your Bible, it's called the parable of the prodigal son. And honestly, it's not really accurate. Now, that's not something that was part of the Greek and Hebrew, that when they put the Bible together, they put titles on certain chapters and certain things so that you could find it easy. Prodigal, in all these years, I never really had to look up that word. It's not a word I use. Anytime you use it, it, it always seemed like it was somebody that was far away from God. And I thought it was somebody who was far away from God who was rebellious. But prodigal actually means spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant. Well, there's a whole lot more that happened to this son than just that. The prodigal son or lost boy was an abuser of grace. Grace is most often defined as unmerited or unearned favor. It's gifts that God gives us that we don't deserve, basically. 
He had a loving father, a good home, provision, a future, and an inheritance, but he traded it all for temporary happiness. So I looked up the word happy, and I thought, you know, that's what he was seeking. It was one of the things he was seeking. He wanted to be happy. He wanted pleasure in his life. And (laughs) as I looked up the word, go ahead and put that up. It was a little ridiculous because this was the definition of it. Feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. Yeah, nah. You know, because if I went to every single person in this room and I asked you, what is your definition of happiness? What makes you happy? Every single person would have a different thing. So, I, you know, me being who I am, I wrote my own definition. So hopefully this, this will explain it a little better. So my definition says it is a euphoric feeling or emotion, I want you to remember that, of great excitement based on a circumstance or experience that brings great pleasure. Remember that word pleasure. Second Timothy, Timothy 3, 1 through 4 says this. You should know this, Timothy, and this is Paul talking to Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. I I believe we are in, if not in the last days, we're right on the precipice of it at least. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. So I must tell you this, that this creeped into the church to a certain degree. And everybody in this room, me, especially Pastor Tom, is guilty of this to some degree. Luke, <laughs> I love this guy, that's all we, this is our relationship. Luke eight fourteen says this, the seeds that fell, now he's talking about the seeds from the parable. If you remember the seeds fell uh, and the birds ate it up and the seeds fell on rock and it grew up and then just it didn't have any root. And the seed means the word of God. So that's, we hear the word of God constantly. We hear the word of God in this place. We should be hearing the word of God, reading the word of God on a daily basis. These seeds, this word that fell among the thorns represents those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. So I'm going to ask you guys a question. I want you to think about it. I do want to hear some answers, but don't just say yes or no. I want you to say yes because of this or no because of this. Is it God's will for you to be happy and have pleasure? I didn't, what I, what did I say? No, you didn't listen. I didn't want to hear yes. Why? No, I'm, I'm messing with you. Why? 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 That's true. That is true. Although, have you ever heard the mother whose son and, or maybe daughter is living in an absolutely sinful life, and they go, as long as they're happy. So God, God is not the kind of God who's like, well, as long as they're happy. Have you heard that? You probably heard it in your own family. You probably said it, as long as they're happy. So let me go ahead and just read, and I won't read all the scriptures, okay, honey? Because she's like, you got to cut some of those scriptures out. <laughs> Psalm 84.11 says this, For the Lord God is our sun and shield, He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will withhold no good thing for those who do what is right. Yes, it is God's will that you have pleasure. Yes, it is God's will that you're happy. It is. Let me read one more. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift is from above. So this is across the board. The atheist that is getting great things in their life, it's all from God and they don't even know it. In fact, If they don't turn, one day he's going to say, come here, let me show you something. (laughs) He's going to show them how intricately God worked and orchestrated things in their life, and they gave the glory to something else. So every good and perfect gift is from, from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. That means the Father of all creation who made all the stars and the universes and and all the suns and all of that, who does not change like shifting 
shadows. So what is the problem here? The problem is this. God has a list for you and me. He's got this list of things that are his will. And we have a list. Everybody in this room, you got your own list. And we hold those next to God and things don't line up. Because God does want you to be happy, but it's way, way down on his list. There's other things that are more important that he's doing in your life. Do you ever wonder why sometimes things don't work out? You know, and then God's saying, that's not what I have for you. At least not yet. So God has his list. What is the first thing on his list? What is his priority for us? And this is rhetorical. Where are these things on our list? Turn to Romans 8, 29 while I take a sip of water. Excellent. You did that so good. For, for those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. All those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So God, looking into the future, saw you. And he saw that you would be here today. And he saw that you would accept Christ as your Savior. So he has this whole destiny pre-planned for your life. Now, it doesn't just happen because we have our part to do too. And if we don't do our part, it's not going to go exactly the way God's plan is. We, remember what Pastor Nick had said, we were children of, of the kingdom of darkness. You know, every one of us were there. We uh, were programmed there. We had our thinking there. Everything, that's like you start telling someone about the Lord, they look at you like you have eight eyes because you're like, it doesn't make sense to them. It's because they're in the kingdom of the darkness. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's working on them already. He knows exactly what they need to hear. So if you just go up with a little flower and say, Jesus loves you, you know, and that's your, that's your thing, it's not going to work for 99% of the people. But if you pray, God will tell you what to say. So we were in the kingdom of darkness we ask Christ in our life. We confessed Jesus as Lord. We believe that God raised him from the dead. Bam, we're in the kingdom of light. Instantaneously. Nothing you did, nothing I did. It was all Jesus. However, <laughs> our thinking process, the way we live, is still in the kingdom of darkness. And it does, it's a process. I don't know if we will ever reach the place where we are 100% in the kingdom of, of God. But God's working on it, and so are we. Amen? Why is our list of priorities so vastly different than God's? Why are our desires, the things that we make, that things that make us happy and bring us pleasure, so high on our list and not God's? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you're brainwashed. Every single one of you. We're all brainwashed. So am I. And the good thing is, is that God brainwashes too. You have to be brainwashed. You're going to be brainwashed. You turn on the TV. Commercials are telling you what you need to buy, how to dress, how to look. Go on social media. What's happening on there? What's the newest thing? What's going on there? We are constantly being brainwashed by the kingdom of darkness still, because this is not God's world. He wins us back. He wins it back one person at a time. And one day he's going to take this world, and that's going to be a great thing. So let's, um, I was uh, in a book, it's called Hacking of the American Mind. This is a, a profound statement here, and I want to read it to you. By Professor Robert Lusting. He says, the more pleasure you seek, the more unhappy you get. The more likelihood you will slide into addiction or depression. Our ability to perceive happiness has been sabotaged by our modern, incessant quest for pleasure, which our consumer culture has made all too easy to satisfy. Those who abdicate happiness for, for pleasure will end up with neither, neither, 
What it is, is we, even as Christians, you know, when I was first saved, I remember, and I felt this, I had an empty hole. I was just a young guy, but I felt that emptiness. And when Jesus came in, it was in the shape of him and he filled that up. But we still have these voids that we're trying to fill. And we're trying to fill it, instead of going to God, we're trying to fill it with happiness and pleasure and the things that we like. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But we continually do this. And and what this says, and I agree wholeheartedly, is that the more you try to feed that with things that aren't God, the more empty, the emptier you're gonna be. To a point where that's that's where why people can go into addiction and they can go further from God and they can be just unsatisfied. I can't get no satisfaction. You know, kind of a world. And this is I'm talking to Christians here. I'm talking to us. Romans 12, 2 says this, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God brainwashes us. He does, if you put yourself in the right position. And what does that mean? How does he do that? Well, before I read the next scripture, In this world, the closest relationship you are supposed to have. Now, this world has distorted it. The enemy has done everything to break marriages up, but it's a marriage between a husband and wife. It should be the most intimate relationship you have or will ever have. And I'm not going to ask how many people have been divorced because, again, that's a product of being in this world. But it is an intimate relationship, and God likens it unto our relationship with Jesus. Jesus being the husband and us being the bride or the, the, the wife. It says in, the, in, in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. You want to deprogram, is that the right word? Unprogram yourself. It's the Word of God that does it. As you read the Word of God, it washes your mind. It cleanses it. There are facilitated pathways. You know what that is? Do you ever see in a, a mountain when it rains and the water goes down a certain path and it goes deeper and deeper? We have those in our minds. So when we're angry, we go down these certain... Why are you going down that road? We go down these certain roads. When things happen in our lives, and many of them were from the kingdom of darkness. So what does Jesus do when we do the word? He fills in the valleys and makes them level. You know that scripture? He brings the mountaintops down. He makes level ground in your mind. So you can actually start understanding the word of God. And the things that used to bring you pleasure, you realize how empty they are and were. And the things of God began to be pleasurable for you. And it is a process. It's something you need to do, and reading the Word is the key. God knows exactly what you need when you need it. He knows what you want, when it's best for you, and He designed in you desire, and He knows these things far better than anyone else, even you, especially you. Sometimes when I'm married, you know, (laughs) being married, I think Gina knows me better than me because... There's times she'll be like, no, you don't want that. You don't, no, you want, this is, what you, this is what you need. And I look at her like, who are you? Because she, she's right. She's, husbands, listen to your wives. She's right. But God knows us even better. Jeremiah 1.5 says this, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Now, that's a great scripture for a reason why abortion's wrong. First of all, God formed us in in the womb. God did it. God formed us. And, you know, when they take that life, they're taking a life that God is forming and has formed. But he formed you. He knows every part about you. You're trying to find yourself. You're trying to discover yourself. You're trying to find your way in this world. You're doing it on your own. It's it's, It's like years ago I drove in California. Along, and I don't know the name of the highway. Do you know the name of the highway? It's along the Pacific Coast. I heard eight different, but, but you're all right. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, whatever it was called, <laughs> it was amazing. And it was one of the most treacherous roads I'd ever been on. 
I mean, you're going around these curves, and you're, and you're like thousands of feet up, and there's the ocean. It's beautiful. And there were times, I remember driving and thinking, man, I just, I got behind this person that was going like so slow. And I just thought, you know, if I could just quickly, and I mean, just as I was thinking that, a big truck came right around the end. <laughs> that would have been the end of me, you know? And the Lord said, this is life, John. You're on this road to life. You have no idea what's ahead of you. You have no idea what's coming. And there's times when it looks clear to go, and you hear me say no. And you do it anyway. Or there's times when you're like, there's no way, I'm going. And the Lord says, it's time, go. This is the time. He said, it's almost like if I'm someone up in a helicopter, you know, 500 feet, 1,000 feet above you, and I could see everything in both directions. You see, God knows you. He knows exactly what you need. He knows, he formed you. He created you the way you are. And he knows exactly what to do. Joy is the standard, the base, the platform by which we live. Now, let me explain joy. In fact, I'm going to have to read Psalm 16. Sorry, but I'm trying to skip scripture to get to this. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. So what is joy? Again, I looked it up. <laughs> Did I put that thing up there? It was just like all there, just this, a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. Well, I will tell you, joy is not a feeling. It's not. It can move your emotions. It can move your feelings. So I wrote my own definition again. Sorry. So joy is more than a feeling, like this, the Boston song, more than a feeling. Okay. Joy is more than a feeling or an emotion. It is the unwavering and unshakable knowledge that the God of all creation is with you always, has given you his favor, and will see you through every circumstance that arises in life with the very best and successful outcome with you in mind. And the great thing about that is, yes, it can stir your emotions, but it's always there. You always have that. It's like a rock. Whatever you're going through, and, and I'm not just speaking out the side of my mouth. Some of you know that I had some terrible tragedies in my life. and I was, I was married before, and I became a widower. And being in the ministry as many years, I've seen people go through, I've seen people lose their pets and walk away from God. And I'm not, I love my pets, but, you know, no pet dying is going to take me away from Jesus. But when you're holding the person that's most important in your life and you're holding their dead body, you kind of, kind of makes you think, <laughs> to say the least. But it was joy. I wasn't smiling. I wasn't happy. It didn't move me to emotions. But I felt the steadfast God, like an anchor. If you see a cup up here with an anchor on it, that's like Pastor Nick's thing. That's, his, that's why he's got a tattoo at an anchor, because God is our anchor. It's an anchor that holds you steady during the greatest storm or storms that can come your way. Joy is a strong part of that anchor. In fact, in Ephesians 3, 20 to 21, it says, Now to him who was able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to his power that is working within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ through all generations forever and ever. And true joy can only come from the persona of Jesus. People talk about joy in this world, but they're talking about happiness and emotions. Joy does not fluctuate. Joy is a steady, steady road. In fact, in John, I'm only going to read one of these, okay, buddy? John 15, 11 says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Jesus has given each one of us a measure of joy. When you receive Christ, you receive a lot of stuff. He puts this measure of joy in you, this steadfast rock. And it's this thing that's always there. Because, see, I know no matter what happens in this life, okay, if I have to go to the end, I'm, I'm going to be with Jesus, man. I'm going to be forever in eternity. No more crying, no more pain. I mean, I know I have that. You, you uh, read and, and see the people that are in prison all over the world, like in China, say, find someone with a Bible. 
and they're in prison 10, 20 years. What keeps them steady and steadfast? In prison, they can't see their family. They're beaten many times on a daily basis. It's the joy of knowing that God is with them. It's that joy. It keeps them strong. In fact, Nehemiah, so Nehemiah, in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah gets his burden. Like, And 70 years are up, by the way. They were taken away from Jerusalem, and after 70 years, they were supposed to come back. So it's around that time. And he's thinking he is the, uh, I believe he's the cupbearer of the king, who was a very important person because that person tasted everything the king did, and, and he trusted him. And the king looks at him and says, you know, you look depressed. What's, what's going on? And he says, King, you know, I, I long for my country. It's, it's my home. It's where I belong. It's where I should be going. And, you know, what the king didn't take it personal and think, well, you're not happy here. He was like, okay, what do you need? What do you, what do you need? He gives him everything he needs to rebuild. He lets scores of people go and they all go back to Jerusalem. And while they're building or just starting to build, he says, Ezra, we can't. We got to start this with the Word of God. Now, again, I'm paraphrasing. So read the first five books of the Bible, which are, which are the Book of the Law, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. Now, most of these people were born in captivity. Seventy years is a long time. They never even heard the Word of God. They didn't meet regularly. They weren't allowed to, and they were allowed to stay and keep their they, to stay Jewish. But they weren't allowed to gather. I mean, they, they probably did it secretly. But Ezra starts reading this. And imagine those who haven't heard it in 70 years. And everyone starts to weep. They start to cry. Part of it, it's, it's a joyful thing. But part of it is just what they've been missing out. Because God's word is powerful. And as they're crying, Nehemiah looks at Ezra like, whoa, whoa, they didn't expect that. And Nehemiah says, uh, listen, 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 listen. He says, go, go and enjoy choice foods and, and sweet drinks and, and send some of those who have nothing, pre- prepare them, give them something. Because this day is holy. Shouldn't be crying on this day. This day is holy. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's our strength. It's the one thing that's going to hold us through all those dark times. Paul says in Philippians 4.4, 4, you don't have to put that up, but he says, always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. How do we rejoice? How do we tap into that? I don't even know where that is in my spirit. I just, I don't. But in later on, and I'm going to paraphrase this because again, I want, I want to move on. Um, he gives you the key. How do you rejoice? And he goes on to say, fix your eyes on what is true, on what is honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about these things. They are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and receive. If you do that, you tap into that joy. You tap into it because you're getting your mind, again, the brainwash thing, you're getting it focused on what's right what's true, what's pure, what's good. Amen? And finally, it's like, where did I, how did I get all of this with the first son? Well, it came, it came about by his choices, by his list. Obviously, he chose <laughs> some things that weren't right. And to, talk, and, and to get us focused on what's our list? What is God's list? We still have our own list. Psalm 37, 4 to 7 simply says this, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I'm going to stop there because that can go two ways. You can say, man, I got all this great stuff. God's going to do it. Yes. Or God's going to place inside of your heart, he's going to give you the desires that you should have as you submit to him. And I think it's that one. As you submit to God, the things, that, the things I used to love and I thought were great, man, I'm like, ew, how did I ever have anything to do with those things because God is starting to place his desires in our heart. You know, when you pray and you pray for things and they don't happen, you're like, well, I thought it said whatever I pray in the name of Jesus. You know, we start, and, and it's like, wait a minute, there's a little catch to that. You gotta be praying things that are on his list. <laughs> you gotta be like, you know, not self-centered and selfish things. And, you know, but I think of a boat is a good thing. I think... <laughs> Right, men? 
You know, I think going golfing every weekend is, and God's saying, yeah, I got something else for you. I got something better. All right, I'm going to talk about the second son. So I called this, by the way, instead of the parable son or the prodigal son, I called it the lost boys because these two boys were lost. And as we get into this son, you're going to find out that he was actually even more lost than his brother. And he usually represents... He usually represents the Christian, in a sense. The one who is in the father's house. He remains faithful to the father. He, he does all the things the father wants him to do. And let's go on and read. And let's start with Luke, right where it is in that. So Luke 15, 28 to 32. And you know, it's good to see it on the screen, but if you could turn to it, it's even better. It gives me time to drink. All right. So he, he this, this party's going on, okay? Let me just, the father kills the fatted calf. They save that for a very, very special, usually it's weddings and feasts. But he's like, my son's home. My son's alive. And I want to stop because I told you I'm not going to say a lot about the father. But those of you that have sons and daughters that aren't exactly in the Lord, or maybe they're way out. I want to share something with you. Stop trying to reach out for them. And what? what? That's, that's horrible. Did the prodigal son's father go after him? Answer that. Did he try to find out where he was? But then say that in the story. Did he send servants? And me, I'd be sending servants like, tell me, how's it going? Is he kind of wavering? Is he what? You don't hear anything. He waited. He waited, and I'm going to explain why in a minute. He didn't go after him. Sometimes you could push your children further away. Especially, <laughs> there were times I would say to my son or daughters, I'd say, hey, I want to pray for you. And they would get so offended by that. I meant it with sincerity. Even just that was enough to be like, I don't want anything to do with your God, with your religion, with whatever. When, when their mom passed, it said a schism in my family, and they chose to reject everything we ever taught them. And I mean, they're out there, man. They are like way out there. Um, one, I believe, is, is into witchcraft. It's like your worst nightmare as a Christian father raising your children. One is into every, everything he thinks is best in every false religion. It's like, like he went to a, a shelf and said, hmm, I think I'll take that and I'll take, oh, I believe in Jesus, he'll say. It's not the Jesus that you believe in. <laughs> like, well, where are you getting your information about Jesus? Not the Jesus of the Bible. <laughs> well, there is a Jesus out there who, who's a demon. He, there's, a, there's a, and I know this just through experience in, in dealing, especially like false religions like Jehovah's Witness. They'll say they believe in Jesus. Their Jesus is not Jesus. It's not. So, and that's all I'll say about that. But I want to tell you this. So I'm praying one day and I'm saying, God, Reach my children. What do you want me to do? And I, as I pray, I pray constantly for them. And I said, they're so lost. And you know what the Lord said to me? And it about knocked me over. He said, John, they're exactly where I want them to be. Didn't you hear the things I said, Lord, that they're into? He said, yep, they're exactly where I want them to be. And I'm like, whoa, you're going to have to explain that one to me. He said, John, they can't be saved by your experience. You could share it with them all they want. They've already rejected it. They have to experience me, the real God, the true God, on their own. And God, when we say, I got saved, I found Jesus, you know, we laugh, but we really did. You found Jesus in the midst of your hell and your unbelief and all that stuff. They need to find Jesus there. And God could send people into bars. He could send people... He can have somebody knock on their door. They can turn on the wrong channel. He can, do, he can do those things, and I believe he is. So what is your job to do? Pray. There is nothing more powerful. There's nothing. There's nothing. You can tell them your testimony. You can go, and you can write them love letters and do all this. Let me tell you something. After a while, love letters to them, they're, they get offended by it. This is a screwed up world. That's the nicest word I can say about it. And they have just gone out there. Let God do it by your prayers. Amen. All right, let's move on. So, 
The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. The father came out and begged him. Remember, the father here is God, is a representative of God, okay? But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing that you told me to do. And in all the time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet my, yet this son, note that, of yours, he doesn't say my brother, does he? That's so unusual. You, you talk about, do you talk about your siblings like that? Your mom, hey mom, how's, how's that son of yours doing? I mean, unless you have a problem with him. Unless you don't, okay. <laughs> this son of yours, there's, there's a lot here that you need to pick up on. This son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes. You celebrate by killing the fatted calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. Remember, he divided it in the beginning. He gave this son his half. So he's the patriarch of the family. He's, he's, he's still the lead of that family. It's a little different now. We don't... We don't honor our patriarchs and our matriarchs anymore like they used to. But this, it was proper to do that. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. I want to say one more thing. They're, they're not your children. Sorry. But I bore them. Women, you know, I bore, carried this child. I had the pain. They're not yours. They're not. They're his. I'd rather than be his. You know, I, this way, I don't have to carry that burden. I just, when I start getting days of when I grieve and long for them, I pray and then I give it to the Lord. They're your kids, God. It's your problem. This is your problem. You know what to do. Keep me out of it. But if there's something you want me to do, I'm here. I'm here like the father. I'm waiting. I'm looking for my son. So what is the son? You can tell where the son is. Okay, he didn't, he didn't hide it. Number one, he dishonors his father. He doesn't even go into him. He, did, he refuses to obey him when he says, come on in the house. His father has to come out and beg him. Okay, number one. When he says, I've slaved for you, there's something off in his heart. He lost, this, or maybe he never even had a servant's heart. Because a servant is not a slave. A servant does it willingly. A servant serves. Jesus came, number one thing he came to do was to serve, not to be served, not to be served. He didn't know the Father. He didn't have intimacy with him because he said, you didn't even give me a young goat. And the Father's like, wait a minute. Did you miss the part when I gave everything to you? It's already yours. He didn't have intimacy with his brother. Like I said, he said, this son of yours he didn't even consider him his brother. He lost his intimacy with God. He had bitterness and unforgiveness. Basically, what he is showing are fruits. If you get near someone, good or bad, you're going to start seeing what they're all about sooner or later. They're, they're, some of those, those things are called fruits. The son was every bit as lost as the other son. In fact, according to the scriptures, in a worse state. And I'm going to read this. Revelation 3.15, the church of Laodicea. You guys know that. Seven churches, letters written to that were legit churches, and God had something to say about every one of them. The church of Laodicea was the last one. And they also represent time periods of the church throughout history. Because they can clearly look back and see time periods when, oh my gosh, this is when the church, they went through this, and this is what was going on there. Well, we're in the last one called the Church of Laodicea. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the greatest thing because this is what he says. Uh, you can put it up and I'm going to read it. It says, I know all things you do, that you're neither, God bless you, that you're not, neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. Now think about that. What is hot for God? That means, man, you're on fire for him. You are seeking him. You are in his word. You are coming to church. You are sharing the gospel. I mean, you are on, that's hot for God. He says, or cold. Who is cold? The son, the first son. He was completely away from the father. He said, I'd rather you be that 
than to be lukewarm, like this son was. You go to church sometimes, maybe every week. You read the Bible sometimes, if you feel like it. You pray. Maybe you use the name of Jesus in wrong ways. (laughs) That's not prayer, by the way, when you get mad at somebody and you say his name. You worship in church. Some of you do. Some of you just come for the entertainment of it. Listen, man, I see you out here. I see you up here. I'm not judging you, but I see some people are just like having a great time, but it's not about that. I'm going to tell you right now, God didn't save you to go to church. God didn't save you to read the word of God. He saved you to become the likeness, into the likeness of Jesus Christ, but he's also saved you to talk about what we're going into. I want to talk about fruit. Why fruit with this son? Because he was showing the fruit. He was showing his fruit of who he really was. I mean, to, to talk to, father, to the father, like he, I mean, the way he was, to talk to God the way he was in a sense. He was showing his fruit. Luke 6, 43 to 45 says this. A good tree can produce bad fruit. And a bad tree, I'm sorry, a good tree can't produce bad fruit. And a bad tree can't produce good fruit. This is important. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs are neither gathered uh, from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. A good person produces good things from the treasures of a good heart and the evil produces evil things from the treasure of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So that fruit is, is... the word identified is proof. What is it proof of? Okay, what is it? That's, that's, I'm, you don't have to answer that. So what fruit is, is the outward expression of being saved. Now remember, it's the evidence of that. You're, you're saved by grace. You're saved the moment you sincerely ask Christ in your heart. Lord, make your Lord... I believe God raised you from the dead. That very second had nothing to do with you. You just, by faith, said that in your heart. And guess what God did? He came in. Okay. So, now, how can people tell that you're saved? How can God tell that you're saved? God knows everything. It's by fruit. And there's many kinds of fruit. Many kinds. Matthew 3, 8 says, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. That, the, the phrase, the way you live, is carpent, which actually means fruit. Prove by your fruit that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. John 15, 5 says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce Much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. So fruit is, it can be the outward expression of the Holy Spirit. They're the the fruits of the Spirit. You've heard of that. That's not what this is talking about, though. Because the fruits of the Spirit, is, are they're, they're little nuggets from the Holy Spirit for you. When you receive the Holy Spirit, that help you to walk out your, your walk. And what they are is love, joy. It's a little bit more joy from the Holy Spirit there. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. These are the things that help you to move on in God, that strengthen you. They're a personal thing. Now, people can see if you're kind and if you're patient, but that's not the fruit we're talking about here, what Jesus is talking about in the vine. Galatians 5, 22, 23 says this, by the Holy Spirit, hmm, excuse me, but the Holy Spirit produces his... Oh, I already read that. I'm so sorry. Let's go to Ephesians 2.10. It says, so for we are God's handiwork created... This is awesome. For we are God's handiwork. And I like to stop there because the Latin word for that is, to me, the best. It means magnum opus. You're God's magnum opus. What's that mean? That sounds like a disease. <laughs> magnum opus means you're his greatest work, his greatest creation, you. Not the angels. You wonder why one of the reasons Satan fell away? It was jealousy. (laughs) It was jealousy. When God 
shared with them that he was going to create man and they're going to be, they're your greatest work. I mean, Satan was beautiful. He had stones of, of all kinds of different stones actually in, in him, in his body. He was beautiful. The Bible says in, in King James that there were, they called him tabernacles, like almost like pipes, like a pipe organ. They believed that he was actually the worship leader in heaven. Uh-oh, watch out for worship leaders. No. <laughs> that he led worship. They believe he led worship in heaven. But apart from that, you, <laughs> you, every one of you are his masterpiece, his magnum opus. Created in Christ Jesus to do what? What's it say up there? Good works. He created you to do works. Now listen to this, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So it's a no-brainer. God's already got a plan now. What do you have to do? Follow him. Follow his list. What do you have for me? Where do you want me to go? What do you, and then he, he opens it up. Well, I don't know. I can't talk to people. I'm, I'm embarrassed to talk to people. Great. You're perfect because you're going to pray maybe more than the average person. And then you're going to start hearing what the Holy Spirit tells you to say. And I'm going to share a story with you in a minute. Something along those lines. The fruit that God wants for our lives are the righteous works that we do. And I'm going to bring that even into another, even a little bit more refinement. Wait a minute, I thought we're not saved by works, right? We're not saved by works, lest any man boast. I mean, then Mother Teresa is like the queen of works, man. That woman did. You know that Mother Teresa did not get saved by one thing. She, well, come on, she's fed millions. She went and, and brought medicine to these dying, didn't save her. If she stood before God and said, look what I did, these are my works, he'd say they're filthy rags to me. Not because God is hard to please, but because nothing compares to what Jesus did. You needed somebody to die for you. Not just somebody, you needed Jesus. And we still need Jesus. So it's, it's, it's not the righteous work. We are not saved by works, but they are a byproduct, listen, a result of being saved. How important is this to the Lord? All right, we're going to get, it's going to get a little tough here. But you all need to listen. Because God is doing a work today. And he wants to change you. He wants you to say, enough of this, this Christian ease stuff. We're going to get serious now. Because if you don't, you're not going to make it in this world to where it's going. We're not going to make it unless we get this right. John 15, 1 to 2 says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. I'm going to tell you a parable about that in a second. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. What if, say that again. He cuts off every branch in me. These are people that are in Christ. They're in him. They're in the vine that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it can bear even more fruit. You know, when I had my tragedy, one of the things I said was, God, I mean, I served you. I started rehearsing some of the things, the fruit that I had. And the Lord said, this scripture, I'm pruning you, son. I'm pruning you. It's, you know, welcome to the ministry. Welcome to real Christianity. It's tough. It's hard. You got to do something. Coming in here and sitting in church isn't it. Reading the Bible is not it. Praying is not it. Worshiping is not it. Those are things you do for yourself. God's not up there like, oh, look what they're doing for me. He's not like that. You're doing that for yourself. You're doing that to strengthen yourself, to gird yourself up. We do what we do to equip you, to help you get girded up, to help you get strong. Why? So you can go home and go to work nine to five and go to sleep and have your dinners and say you love your wife and spouse. No so that you can go and have fruit. It goes on further to say in John 15, 7 to 8, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear fruit showing that what? You're my disciples. So you get saved. You give your heart to Christ. It's sincere. It's real, man. You feel Jesus. You know, your whole life. Is, I, was, I told you, I was 16 years old. I felt it. 
I know, but you wanna, and I'm not bragging. You know what? I was watching 700 Club. I got saved watching that. If some of you watched it back in the day, you remember Ben Kinchlow? I love that man. He's the, one, he's the one who led me to the Lord. And you know what he said? You've received Christ as your Savior, go tell somebody. And I'm like, okay. I got on the phone. I called my best friend. I called my girlfriend. I called some guy who said he was born again. Because <laughs> I was like, dude, I did it. Let me, you know, and, I, and you know what was amazing as I look back? I was quoting scripture. I'd never read the Bible. I was quoting scripture to these people because of the Holy, Holy Spirit was already using me. That's the first thing I did. I thought, that's what I'm supposed to do. After that, I got baptized, you know? So there's a parable in, in the Bible that, that kind of accentuates this. It talks about the owner of the vineyard. That's the father. He comes to the vineyard. And he's got all this, he's got all kinds of trees and vines, and he goes up to one of them, and he calls the gardener over. He says, come here. The gardener represents Jesus. He says, I've been coming here for years to this tree. It's not producing any fruit. Cut it down. Cut it down, burn it, get rid of it. Get it out of the garden. I don't even want to see it anymore. I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus, who lives to intercede for us, says, I'll tell you what. I'm going to dig around the roots. He wants to stir things. He's going to stir some things up in your life. I'm going to put some fertilizer in there. You know what fertilizer is? It's crap. <laughs> Somebody said that? <laughs> it's crap. Jesus is going to put crap in my life? Well, he's going to allow it if that's what it takes because he loves you and he wants you to produce fruit. He says, I'm going to do this. I'm going to trim it. If by this time next year, now, that doesn't mean you have a year from this date. That means everybody's going to have their own time period where the Lord says, enough. Okay? By this time next year, if there is no fruit, I will personally cut it down myself. You know what we are? We're atomic bombs. Now, I'm not a physicist. In fact, I'm going to sound like an idiot trying to explain this, but... Basically, very, you could probably explain it to Tom. This guy is brilliant. He is. He just, when he speaks sometimes, I'm like, where did he get that from? It must have been a book. You mean we actually have to read books? I, I go on my iPad. Never mind. An atomic bomb, what it does first, this is very simplistic. It implodes, means it actually explodes inward. It has something to do with the atoms and how they split the atoms. It has something to do with all of that stuff, which I don't know about. But if it doesn't implode, it's not going to explode. And the fact that it implodes makes it a greater explosion. This is what they've discovered. It makes it, it, you don't need a bomb the size of this block. You can have one the size of this table now because of the physics that they've learned. And it implodes. So we're Christians. We accept Christ. What do we do? We implode. Whew. Isn't it great? I mean it. There's such power there. We accept Christ. We ask him into our hearts. We start to walk in. You have a problem and you start praying and all of a sudden God gets you through it. You know, all of these personal things, and they're all good. But very few Christians explode. You see, if you don't explode, you're completely missing. God didn't save you because he wanted to bless you. He didn't save you to take you out of your our messes. He'll do that. It's not why I saved you. Oh, they need, they need some help down there. I'm going to save this guy. Then he can live the rest of his life living for himself, working out his own problems every day. He's reading the Bible. That's good. He's going to church. It's a good thing because he's getting stronger by doing that. Or she. He worships. Love the way he worships. He uh, does all of these things, but there's no fruit. There's no fruit. That's what the explosion is. That's how people know you're saved. You go to your neighbor who's a widow and bring her a meal or a widower. <laughs> you know, most men don't cook at all. They're just eating frozen garbage. You bring them a meal and you 
just start off there, especially if they're a neighbor, you can do that ongoing. And then one day, they're going to be like, why are you being so nice to me? Why are you being so good? I'm glad you asked. And you can start sharing your faith with them. See, that's fruit. The fruit God wants, the greatest fruit he wants, it's people. It's people. So, works doesn't save you. But it is an outward sign that you're saved. You can't have one without the other. You really can't. God gives his grace. He gives you time. Let him grow up. Let him be on the milk of the word. Let him, let him get stronger, you know. But it's time. It's, it's time. It's time to produce fruit. In the story of the end of the age, it says, but Matthew 25, 31 to 46, you know the story. And this old story, always, story always scared me. And it should scare you. Jesus said, but when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne, the white throne judgment. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as shepherds separate the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Now, I personally believe this isn't everyone that was ever created. I believe these, these are Christians, all of them. They are all people that said, Lord, Lord, this is what I believe. Because there's another scripture that where people said, he said, just because you said, Lord, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. And I'm going to explain why that is in a minute are going to come in. Were they not sincere? I bet they were. I bet they wept. I bet they repented. I bet they said, Lord, Lord. And he says, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. So it hasn't been 2,000 years that God's been preparing a place for you, has it? From the creation of the world, God has been, been preparing a place for us. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in to your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me, and I was in prison, and you visited me. Or we can say, he turned to them and he said, those of you that have accepted Jesus as your Savior, confessed him as Lord, believe he raised him from the dead. Why doesn't he say that? Isn't that how we're saved? Because there has to be fruit, guys. There has to be fruit. And the church, that's where the church is. They call us a sleeping giant. I saw a picture the other day as I was researching and writing. And I don't know how a pastor did this. He must have had a church of there's thousands. And he was, he probably went in, but okay, everyone act like you're all falling asleep. And they were, I mean, thousands all the way to the back row, not even smiling. They were serious. It was like, you know, snoring and sleeping. And it's a pick, that's, that's where the church is. We're asleep. Keith Green says, asleep in the light. There's, there's, there's words from that song that say somebody, and I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, like somebody comes to your door and, and in a sense they're asking you for help and you say, God bless you, be at peace. And you close the door. And it says all heaven weeps because remember the, the works, the things that he has prepared for you? That was one of them. And he's doing that for you every moment of every day. He's got these things. And well, how do you find them? Ask the Lord to show you. Because what does he say to the others? He says, the king will turn to those on his left and say, and I'm going to share this. Have you ever heard that Jesus isn't going to throw anybody in hell? People are going to send themselves there. Have you ever heard that, Pastor Tom? That's just the biggest, that's not true. He is almighty God. He is holy and sovereign. He is omnipotent and all-powerful. Yes, he has grace and mercy, but it says here, he's going to say, away with you, you cursed ones. And then it goes on to say, because I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When did we see you? Whenever you've done it to the least of these. The least of these are fruit. These are fruit that God wants. 
He wants to come to your garden and he wants to pluck that fruit and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. And sometimes I think my fruit basket's kind of small because I always think, man, I can be doing more and I want to do more. But I promise you that Billy Graham went to heaven when he saw Jesus. He threw himself down and said, I didn't do enough. I promise you he said that. And then God wiped away his, his tears. I bet Mother Teresa did that. I bet Paul said that when he actually saw Jesus. But at least they had fruit to give him. They had something to give him. How terrifying it will be, the final judgment, to stand before him and say, it's like the man in, in the banquet. They had the banquet, they got everybody in, and there was somebody there and they didn't have, they didn't have wedding clothes on. He's like, who let you in? I said, Lord, I prayed. I, he's like, you don't have wedding clothes on. Get him out, tie him up, throw him out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Am I trying to scare you? No, but I hope you are scared. I do. Do you feel shame today? I'm not trying to shame you. I hope you do. If that's what it takes for you to say, doggone it, I'm going to start living this life. I'm going to start producing fruit for God. And he'll show you what to do. He will show you what to do. I want to finish with this. So what's this about? Both of these sons had lists. They had their list. We all do. You all still have your list. I do. And sometimes I'm like, sorry, God, I thought that was on your list. <laughs> nope. And God has his list. So you start seeking, what's your list, God? What is your will? What do you want from me? And it's going to take precedence over the things you want because God wants to renew your mind. He wants you to wash your mind with the word so you know what really is pleasurable, what really does make you happy because God knows you. I've been in Florida 30 years. And if Pastor Nick, you're watching, please don't be offended. I am not a Florida person. I'm not. I don't have a bikini body. I, uh, I just, I hate the heat. Cannot. I mean hate it. I miss the changes of the seasons. You think I'm crazy? I miss snow. I do. I'm not talking about Canadian snow. You got to be a lunatic to miss that. Like, I'm talking about, so we went to visit her mom, who was not in a good way. She was, we, we thought she was, she was dying. She actually was. And God, Gina had never seen snow. She's a southern girl. And my pra- one of my prayers was, God, please don't let her see snow without me. I want to look, I don't care about the snow. I want to look at her face. And it snowed. And she looked like a little child. And she had tears running down her face because it was so beautiful. Because there's nothing like snow in the mountains. Okay, and you know what I did? Ugh. I grabbed some snow in my hand, and I made it into a snowball and hit her right in the head with it. <laughs> Shoom! And she laughed and la- listen. You do your marriage the way you do your marriage. That worked for me. I got me some points. Anyway, I love I love the mountains. Since I was a little boy, I could stand here right now and say there's a yearning in my heart. When I go, we try to go. When I go there, I feel like I'm home. I can't describe it any other way. I saw Jaws when I was 12 years old, and it ruined my life. (laughs) You you think I want to live on a peninsula that's surrounded by the most shark attacks of any other place? Did you know that? Yeah, Florida. Yeah, welcome to Florida. 15 years ago was the last time I went in the water. Well, I'll tell you why. It was, it, was, it was coming up on the anniversary. I celebrate it every year by not going in order. <laughs> Labor Day. I don't remember the year. We go, I'm, I'm not a, I never was a Clearwater Beach person because I don't like the touristy stuff. So we went to uh, Fred Howard Park. Not too far from where you guys live. Real nice park, nice beach, crowded. And see, my thing is I'll go in the water as long as there's a lot of people around me. And I'm in the middle of the crowd. Because then if something happens, I'm out of there. I, one person starts yelling, I got, I got a fighting chance, you know. Hundreds of people, at least. And we're there swimming, having a blast. I didn't even think about sharks. I'm being honest with you. It was like just having such a good time. 
look up and there's like a half a dozen helicopters. And they're circling and they're filming. And no, it's Labor Day. I'm thinking, it's Labor Day. You're filming. Look at the people at the beach. And we're thinking, oh, yeah, that's what it is. So we have our day at the beach. We go home. You ever jump in a pool after going to the beach? How good that feels? It just, ah, oh, it's nothing like that. We had a cookout, great time. And then it was like, hey, let's look at, let's turn the TV on. Because every channel was there. Let's see, maybe we can see ourselves. And we're looking and there's a close-up of people waving or trying to find us and the camera's pulling back. You know, and we're saying, where are we? And they said, a migration of thousands of hammerhead sharks. Where we were when they pulled away, they were all around us. And I'm not talking babies. I'm talking eight, nine, ten, bigger. All around us. Never went in the water again. Listen, when I was a kid, I was afraid to go in the bathtub after watching Jaws. That movie ruined me. It ruined me. Ruined me. So why am I telling you that, this, this story? To make you laugh? Yeah. But I'm also telling you because my greatest, one of my greatest desires is to be in the mountains. Why am I here? Every once in a while, we run into some situations, and Gina's like, let's just pack up and go. Let's just go. And there's two reasons why I don't go. Number one, it's not on God's list yet. I say yet. I do know that when I get to heaven, there's going to be mountains in my backyard. I'm telling you right now. And, and, and that's cool. I could wait for that if I have to. But it's not on God's list. God has not said to go. You know the other reason? You're, it's sitting in front of me. It's you. It's you. God has me here for this time and this season to be your one of your pastors, be your music worship leader. I'm going to tell you about Johnny. Some of you know what I do for a living. To do this, I, for four years, I've driven for Uber and Lyft. And I actually make a very good living at that. Just God has showed me what to do. I drive during the day. I don't drive the mani maniac drunk people at night. I don't have any stories. <laughs> I don't. I don't have this, this, this. People get in and say, tell me your stories. I'm like, boring. I drive during the day. I don't want that in my car because it's just unpredictable. Whether they get sick or they get violent, I mean, anything. So I go to pick up Johnny, and I have one of my pet peeves. I really try to be patient is, look, be on time. you got five minutes. At the end of that five minutes, my little... My, my phone flashes, time to go. And it's counting down. Most people come out in the first minute or less. But there's always those people that know, because it's on their phone too. Two seconds left, Johnny comes out. Really, Johnny? But he doesn't come and get my car. He's got like, I don't know why they had four or five cars there. <laughs> and they needed me. But he starts going in cars and he's pulling stuff out. I'm like, okay. He gets in my car. And, he, and it's quiet, and I back up. And the Lord says, ask him how he's doing. How you doing? He says, uh, terrible. And I'm like, Lord, and I'm going to tell you why. It was like, really, Lord? Because he starts telling me, yeah, I was at a strip club last night. And I'm like, I don't want to hear this. They took me in the back room, and they stole $1,000 from me. I didn't want to ask the details of that. I didn't want to know the details of that. And I'm sitting there for quiet, and yeah, they really messed me up. And the only thing I could think of to say was, uh, I bet you won't do that again. But he laughed. Now, Johnny, Johnny was a tough-looking dude. He was a white guy. He had his hair corn-rolled. My hair would be corn-rolled if I had hair. It'd be corn-rolled because it looks cool. It looked, it looked cool. He had tattoos everywhere, on his neck, on his face. They weren't just regular tattoos. There's no Tweety Birds. They were like skulls, blood, you know. It was like, like gang stuff. And he was a tough-looking guy. And I'm also praying for myself, Lord, please don't let this be my last day on earth. <laughs> Help me not to say anything offensive to Johnny. Help me to get him where he needs to go. So we're going, and I just said, you know, Johnny, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Nobody deserves to lose money like that. He said, my whole life has just been hell. It's just been hell. And then he shares, you know, I, I, I just got out of prison two weeks ago. That's the reason why he was in <laughs> the strip joint. 
men, what's wrong with you? Oh, and, uh, and what's wrong with us? And he's, he says, uh, my best friend in the world was my dad. And someone killed him right in front of me. Four shots, they shot him right in the chest. And he said, I took revenge. Now, he was in, in prison for over two years, so I, I don't know if he murdered someone unless they, they, I don't know, unless they downgraded it to manslaughter. I have no idea. But he messed somebody up enough to be put in, in, in jail, in prison. And he's telling me this story, and I'm like praying, God, what do you want me to say? I want to minister to this man. He needs you. And the Lord says, and I start arguing with the Holy Spirit. Because he says to me, I'm like, really? Really? He says, tell them that's why God is the one who's supposed to take revenge. I'm like, that sounds like I'm like shaming him for that. And the Lord said, say it. <sighs> All right. Hey, Johnny, the Bible says that God is the one who takes revenge. And he says, man, you're right. You are right. I said, you want to know why, Johnny? First of all, he, wants to spare, he wanted to spare you from all of this stuff you've just been through. But also, nobody can take revenge like God. <laughs> I'd, rather have, I'd rather be put in a Chinese prison and stand before a holy God. And these people will not get away with it. If they don't repent, they're going to stand before God and be judged. He's like, you're right. And all of a sudden, this door opened, man. I started talking about the Lord and sharing about God's plan for his life. That whatever he's been through, God can, can seemingly erase and place him on that road. And he can have a great life and a life like he never thought if he walks with Jesus. I said, pray. You know what prayer is? That scares people. Pray. It's talking to God. Talk to Jesus. What do you want, Johnny? What do you want in life? What do you need, Johnny? Tell Jesus. Tell Jesus. Don't tr stop trying to do it yourself. You think the Lord has a wonderful woman for you? that he's already prepared, and you're going to strip clubs? He's like, yeah. I said, you're, you're going to, to, to dog crap compared to this wonderful thing God has. And we started talking and talking, and before I knew it, we were at the stop, and he started to get out of the car, and the Lord said, grab his hand. Now, you don't grab the hand of a guy that looks like he's in a gang. You know, I just want to hold your hand, buddy. No, I mean, I'm like, oh, this is it. This is where I buy it. This, this I died, and nobody would know that I died for Jesus. They just think, oh, I don't know. He was trying to grab some guy's hand. You'd have all kinds of rumors going around. I didn't know he. Oh, Pastor John's gay. He was whole. I mean, that's what you would say, you, you terrible people, you. But I grabbed his hand, and he stopped, and I said, I'm going to pray for you. Because you had that authority. You had the authority over the enemy's territory. And I began to pray. I, I don't even know what I prayed. I just prayed and prayed and prayed, prayed that he would find the Lord, he would accept the Lord, he would receive the Lord. And when I was done, Johnny, this hardened guy, was crying like a little child, uncontrollably. And he kept saying, I needed this. I needed this. Where would Johnny be if I chose my list? If I was in the mountains right now, sitting on the back porch with my wife, drinking a cup of coffee. That sounds wonderful. It's good. It's a good thing. Where would Johnny be? Maybe, would God have brought someone else? I can't tell you he would have. I want to think that, but I don't know. What does God have planned? He's got things planned. Jonathan, he's got things planned for you. John, he's got things planned. Whatever you've been through, he's got, he's got something planned for you. Every day of your life. And if you start going into his plan, if you start saying, I want your list, Lord. He's going to start revealing it. And it's going to be easy like me talking to Johnny. I don't look like a gang guy. I mean, I got earrings, but that's because that's I'm a musician. I'm not a gang guy. How do I talk to somebody like that? People get in, and I don't know. I have every walk of life come in my car. You name it. They've been in my car from transvestites to transgenders to Jewish people to Muslims. And God has opened the door for me to witness to every one of them. Why? Because I'm bold? No. You don't know me. I know I seem out, <laughs> like I'm outward. I'm not. If it was up to me, I'd be at home right now watching the Three Stooges. I just, I am. I just, I, I'm a homebody. I'm like, why I want to go to the mountains? I just want a cabin somewhere and just get away from society. You know, but, <laughs> but here's the thing. He's got those for you. And I just want to remind you of something that happened a few weeks ago when Pastor Green came. He made an offer. And this is what he said. He said, who here will say like Isaiah, here am I, send me. 
And he said, I'm not talking about going to Africa. He showed those, some of those pictures are horrible. I'm not talking about India. I'm, I'll be done in just a second. He said, who here will say, here am I? And nobody raised their hand. Like three people. And then he said, well, let me explain. I'm not talking about Africa. I'm talking about in your sphere of influence, in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school, there. Who will say, here am I, send me? And maybe three or four more people raised their hands. And I'm like, this, you guys are missing it because that's fruit. And if you don't have fruit, you, you, you ain't going. Not because fruit saves you, because fruit is the outward expression of this glorious salvation that we have. I want everyone to close their eyes right now. And ushers don't, or, and nobody moving. I'm not going to ask anybody to come up here. I'm going to ask you to do something. If you would say today, here am I, send me, Lord. Send me to the people in my influence. Send me to the people that I have in my. Send me there. Start there. If you would say that, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm not, don't raise your hand. I want you to stand up right where you are. Stand up and say, yes, here am I, send me. If that's you, say, here am I, send me. And it's okay if you don't stand. That's all right. God's dealing with some things in your life. Maybe you're newly saved. Maybe you're not understanding all this, but I want you to look around now. This is how it's, this is the church. This is, G, uh, uh, Pastor Nick says, go be the church. This is going to be the church. And you guys are going to have testimonies this week. You could start today, like Pastor, Pastor Barry goes, to the, goes out to eat and he says to the waitress, hey, can we, we're going to pray, can I pray with you? It could be as simple as that. It could be as simple as that. Father, thank you for the men and women in this room, every one of them, for those that have said, here am I, send me. Lord, I pray that today, this week, God, you will reveal your plan to them. You'll be able to open it up and they'll be saying, I cannot believe what satisfaction this brings me to share the word, to share the gospel, to tell people about you, to clothe people who are naked, to give someone a cup of cold water. Bless them, Father. Lord, let this be their testimony of the church, that the church is going to explode, Lord God, like an atomic bomb and spread everywhere. Father, do this in Jesus' name. We all agree and pray. Amen. It's late. I'm sorry, guys. I got you out late, but I, I, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Let's, let's give the Lord a praise offering. I want to hear testimonies. I want to hear it, man. Come on. You could do this. If ushers will come up, if you want to come up and pray for any reason, our ushers, our elders, our elders are up here. <laughs> sorry. I, no, no, this is what I wanted. God bless you guys.